Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Cindy McDonald, and I'm so glad to be the hostess for the Friday Forums. This is something that I started right when COVID started as a way for us to make some sense out of what was going on and what was happening in the world around us. And to my amazement, we've been able to continue this now over two years later, and I am just having so much fun providing and presenting different topics, experts in our fields that you can learn and you can grow from. So thank you for everyone for being here today. As you're coming in, please put your name and your location in the chat so that you can see who each other are. And my esteemed guest today, I'm so glad to have Mark Salisbury from Tuition Fit. And he's going to talk about a topic that I don't think we've ever really had addressed. And he's going to talk about demonstrated interest and how that might not always be the best way to go. Mark, I saw this on your blog and I was intrigued because I've never seen anybody write about it from this perspective. So, so welcome, Mark. We're glad to have you here today. It's a treat. It's an honor to be here. It's so great to see you again, Cindy. I think the last time we saw each other, we were sitting next to each other in an exhibit hall pre-pandemic. So um, it's been wonderful to see your journey since then. And uh, I'm sure you've had some fun watching my little roller coaster. I have. I have. I can't remember which conference it was, but I was thinking about that, too. It was back there somewhere. We were somewhere. Yeah, right. Right. I don't right. remember where it was. Somewhere. But. Yeah, so and we have Leanne joining us today. Mar Carmen, my usual um, cohort here, is off doing some kind of visit, something for school. So we certainly don't want to interrupt that. So Leanne, I'm glad to have you here and she's going to help manage questions. You can see we've got people from Switzerland. We're always glad to see... Um, um, was Monica, she's outside of Geneva. Maryland, LA, California. I just love seeing all your names, all your places. And this is just so wonderful. And I've also put a question in here, because this is something I'm really emphasizing during this time of year is make sure you're taking care of yourself. We're all taking care of our students. I like you, I was on the phone with a student this morning, walking through things. What have you done for self-care this week? So share some ideas, even if it's a five minute type of thing, um, make sure you're doing some self-care. So Mark, let me start with that question for you. What have you done for yourself for self-care this week? <laughs> um, honestly, not enough. I, the, that point you just made is I was sitting there thinking, yeah, I should be a sort of person number one to take that advice in. Um, cause it is a really crazy, busy time of year. Um, one of the things that I am enjoying is, uh, the color here in Iowa right now, the leaves on the trees are just popping, um, because we had a little cold snap earlier this week, but it's 80 degrees in Iowa now. So I'm going outside, I'm going for a long walk. I'm going to leave my phone at home. And I'm gonna just really try to take in the color. Uh, I and I think that's an important aspect. The more we can get outside, just take that break. I mean, I just walked to the mailbox yesterday and back, and just just even that was very very helpful. Um, one of the things that I do for self care is I have a time with one of my daughters who lives in another state. And we do a watch party. So we watch a show, we pick a show, and once a week we get together and we talk on the phone while we watch the show together. So mm -hmm. I did that last night with my daughter. So we've got yoga going on, and Karen's shared that, getting shots, all these things that we need to do for self care. So, um, so Mark, you have a very lengthy, um, broad background experience. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. Um, I was one of those young knuckleheads coming out of high school, going to college, didn't have a clue what I wanted to do, just thought that was the next thing. And um, some people might say that I'm still that 
knucklehead, just a lot older. <laughs> but I spent really my whole life since high school in and around higher education. Um, I uh, started thinking I was going to be a professor of American studies. And I went to graduate school. Uh, and while I was in graduate school, I started coaching soccer. I'd played it growing up. Um, it was very clear that I was not going to be a very good academic professor in American studies. Uh, but then I got a chance to be a college soccer coach for almost a decade. And as a function of that, I did all kinds of work in admissions and financial aid and uh, interacting with people all over campus. After a decade of that, I really sort of burned out in the athletics world and slowly started to transition to admissions before I, I just got really curious about, I kind of have a sense of how higher education works, but there's a whole bunch of this stuff that I don't get. <laughs> and so I got really lucky. I got a chance to go to a PhD at the University of Iowa with some of the most uh, well-known and successful faculty and researchers in, in higher ed um, over the last several decades. And so I was a PhD student, PhD student in my mid-30s and uh, got a PhD and graduated right at the time when the economy tanked and there were no faculty jobs again. <laughs> so um, I had done a number of things uh, related to how do you use data to get better, both as an institution and across the different parts of an institution, in admissions, in teaching and learning, in student affairs. And as a function of that, I was invited to apply for a job that I didn't even know existed called Director of Institutional Research and Assessment. Um, I think I, I really wish I would have changed the name of that job to uh, Chief Nerd or <laughs> Nerd Czar, because it really is it's sort of the most data nerd job ever. Um, and yet it was a treasure trove for me because it was really getting into what's what is it that we actually know about how higher ed works? What do we wish we know, that, wish we knew that we don't have data about for? I spent, you know, weeks of my life reporting data to the federal government, the stuff that everybody uses from iPads and the common data set. Um, I made that sausage. I know how that stuff works now. So I spent roughly the next decade as a researcher, scholar, um, consultant, director of institutional research, constantly working on how do we use data to get better. And 2018, uh, a number of things happened in, in my career that sort of all came together to set up this, maybe I'm gonna just try something crazy. And the one data point that we all don't have that we all wish we had was the actual prices the colleges charge. And the actual prices that students are asked to pay. How could we build that data set? And the idea finally sort of popped in my head one day, well, I think we might have to just crowdsource it. And so that led to starting Tuition Fit and the journey over the last four years of organically from the bottom up, building a data set that everybody can use to circumvent all the stress about financial aid and price and sticker price and net price and everything else and just get to what's the price that students like me are being asked to pay and use that to help people uh, make more confident, better informed choices on making a financial fit. Well, <clears throat> that really points out to a big point in higher education. Well, two things. First of all, the cost of higher education has skyrocketed. It's gone higher than it's increased more than even healthcare in mm -hmm. our society. And so it used to be, oh yeah, you could just you know pay for it or work and earn your money as you go, but that is no longer possible at all. Um, used to be the second largest investment you would make. And now for many families, especially if you have more than one child, it's gonna be the largest investment you make in, in, you know, in your life. And yet, I've always compared it to this big black box. You would never buy a car. You would never buy a house without knowing exactly how much you're going to pay, not only at that moment, but over time. And yet in higher education in college, it's like you're supposed to close your eyes, hold out your hands and say, yeah, tell me how much I'm going to pay and I'll do it. And you're shining a light on that saying, wait a minute, hold up. Let's, let's not, let's, let's do some realistic perspective on this. 
Because just like, you know, in planes, everybody pays something different. So how do you know how much you're going to pay? So, so how, how did that, tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. I mean, you know, what, what goes into that? It sounds nice on the surface, but sure. how do you really do that? Well, you know, the, one of the things that, that it's a big conversation amongst Gen Z students and, and, and individuals, but it's an issue that we all, we all think about an awful lot, especially those of us, uh, everybody on this call who really care about young people and really trying to help them succeed in life. We all want the students we work with, we want them to develop this real sense of agency, that they're in control of their future, that they dictate who they're going to become. We want that for them for obvious reasons, right? Because that's what makes successful young people and that's what makes a successful society, right? Mm -hmm. And what I had seen over you know, a couple of decades was the degree to which that was vanishing among students and families because the system is the way the system has become. And you know, back in the 1980s, when, when I went to college the first time, um, you know, most people paid the sticker price. The sticker prices were a lot lower, mm -hmm. but you could use the sticker price as a means of figuring out, like, is that school in my price range or not? For a lot of different reasons and people can go see the ted talk i gave a couple of years ago on this very topic about how college prices got to where they are but colleges decided that the sticker price was not going to be a measure of affordability anymore it was just gonna be a sort of a signal of quasi quality and that so then we'll just have the sticker price be whatever we want it to be and the actual price that people pay will be way less but we just want to get them in the door. So if they apply to us because they think we're awesome, then they're not going to apply to 20 other schools. And so now our chances of getting that student are a lot better. Then we'll give scholarships and discounts, whatever we want, whatever it needs to get that student. Right. And that worked for a while, but that's one of those things where once you're out of the barn with that model, you can't really go back very easily. You can't turn around the next year and say, just kidding. We, it's not that because you're going to have some pretty upset students and alumni, right? And so colleges have been on this train that they can't get off of. And a lot of things have changed. A lot of things have shifted over the past several decades so that folks are now just thoroughly frustrated with college pricing. They feel like they have no control. They feel like they're just beholden to whatever and, and you're hoping. And that really kills any sense of agency here. And so part of what drive drove me to start this was we really need to empower families and students to feel like they aren't powerless to, to be able to make a choice that's right for them. So I know how college pricing models work, made that sausage, been involved with it. So basically we just said, well, we can reverse engineer that and let's not take the magic eight ball model. That's the way that colleges have done it now for the past 10 years with the net price calculators and the other tools that are out there where there's sort of this, we're gonna use all this data out there to pre predict and get it right, what's your price gonna be? Because that magic eight ball model turns out not to work very well, both because the data underneath it's just not good enough to be very good at predicting very often. And once you're wrong, you've lost all your credibility, right? So instead, let's just do it in such a way that everybody can see what everybody else is being charged. And then you can make a decision about whether you're willing to pay more than that or less than that, or you don't want, like you as a consumer can be empowered, just like when you buy a car, just like when you buy a house. And supply and demand plays out as it would, right? Trying to go hard and negotiate UCLA down, not going to work. Why? Because they got 150,000 applications, right? But at another school that's really struggling to get students, that's how this works, right? But you can't do it without that information. So I, that was the premise. And, and so as a function of that, we built a process whereby families can upload their award letters. We redact all the private information, anonymize everything. It's a secure portal so that we thoroughly protect everybody's information. And once we redact all the information from an award letter, we destroy the original. So we don't even have it. And that creates a way for 
every individual student or family to sort of be in a particular bucket. And then C, once you've shared, you get to, as a, as a trade, a free trade, if you will, once you share information, now you get to see what everybody else like you has shared. And you'd see prices from hundreds of other schools. You might see prices from the same school. And you then as a consumer get to make some choices. The nice thing about that data set is then at the same time that families, the seniors are trying to make some pretty important decisions, families with juniors and sophomores can use the data set in a slightly different way to build a list of schools that fit their price range. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. now this thing works sort of at the front and at the back of the college process. And it's certainly not intended at all to somehow replace all the other things that matter in picking a school that's the right fit. But it just is intended to help people make sure they nail the financial fit part of it so that there's no more of this 11th hour surprise. There's no more of this panic. There's no, and, and even I should say, even if as a student, you see that there's a school that you're looking at that's really outside of your price range, but you still really want to go there. At least you know, and you have motivation now that back in July, you're starting to apply for scholarships because you know you're going to need that to get there. Like that clarity just changes the way that you can attack this process because now you're attacking it with knowledge and agency. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think, you know, what you're, what you're describing in, over the last few years is what we often refer to as strategic enrollment management, right? And that's where having, and Peter Van Beskirk, um is going to be my guest on the Friday Forum in two weeks. And he's going to talk about that. And he's actually going to show one of those um, strategic enrollment management charts, you know, how they distribute aid and offer aid and what happened at Franklin Marshall when mm -hmm. they started using that model and how it increased the level of students and level opportunities. And I think, you know, when it started, it was a way to help middle income families and other families, because there weren't a lot of merit awards out there, and yet a lot of families were missing out. And so it was a way to help families be able to afford and, and qualify, because that calculated EFC is a number that's not realistic anymore right. for any family. You know, right. it doesn't account for, I mean, hasn't been changed. I mean, the formula itself right. basically right. Hasn't been changed for what, like 50 yep. years? Yeah, it's, yeah, you know, and yet flawed, prices yeah. and everything have gone up. So it's not realistic. So, so there's a lot of good reasons for it, but knowing and, and just having that clarity and that the being transparent is key. So let's turn to the whole demonstrated interest. So first of all, tell us what your definition of demonstrated interest is. And um, yeah, and Leanne, if you can find the blog that I read that's on Peter's website, stick that in the chat as well so people can see that. So, so what's demonstrated interest? Yeah, I, I, I will start with I was thinking about this when you asked me to like give a definition and I went all Webster's on me myself for a second. And then I realized that probably the best way that the way that I think about it, and I realized that the way that I look at this is through a particular lens, but I'm just going to send people back to a rock and roll band from Rockford, Illinois, back in the seventies and eighties called Cheap Trick. I want you to want me. Think of that song. If you don't know that song, go find the video on YouTube. But that's essentially what demonstrated is at, at the core of this. Demonstrated interest is the student trying to convey to the school that I want to go there bad enough and I want you to want me to come, right? It's not. And then, of course, the lyrics get a little bit outside of the demonstrated interest world. I need you to need me. Anyway, we won't go there. But the point is um, demonstrated interest is this big sort of construct that has evolved into something that is conventional wisdom, right? That students need to convey to schools that they want to go to how much they really want to go to them. And it's kind of expanded now to a thing where folks say, every school you apply to, you should convey demonstrated interest. You should really, you know, show them the love, if you will. And, mm -hmm. you know, as you get further up the 
the pecking order of more selective schools, you can find more and more admissions folks that'll have stories about uh, demonstrated interest gone wild. Um, whether it's a box of cookies every week for several weeks until the decisions come out or, or something. Um, but it's this notion that goes from pretty reasonable to really outlandish. And it's premised on the idea that if you convey to the school that you really, really want to go there, you're going to have a leg up in getting it. Yep, it, it's very much admission based. And yep. we've had, I've had guests who have actually shown on Slate, you know, the technology that a lot of colleges use to track that, where they can see every email that's been open, whether they sent them an email and what happened, and those kinds of things. So what are some of the benefits of, of you know, we just talked about that, demo, you know, that definition is that it shows them that you care about the college. So that's obviously one of the benefits. Would there other be other benefits that you would identify or recognize to showing demonstrated interest? I think, the, to, in my mind, the biggest benefit of demonstrated interest has really very little to do with the admissions decision. And has a lot more to do with helping the student be engaged in, is this a place I want to be and why? And how do I convey that intelligently and sincerely and authentically? And it, the idea behind it really, I think done right, helps students start to see themselves again, back to the agency idea, as agents of their own future success. So they get involved in, why, why do I wanna go there? And then how can I convey that? And how can I articulate that? And I think that really helps them in growing as young people, right? It helps them emerge as a person who's now, um, I want that thing, I'm gonna, think about why I want that. And then I'm going to go convey that I want that thing. And I'm going to go toward it because nobody's just going to hand it to me. Um, and I think those are the things about demonstrated interest that are really, really positive. Um, the degree to which demonstrated interest actually affects admissions decisions um, is wildly overstated, right? That that you know, you set aside all of the schools of common data sets that say that they don't care about demonstrated interest. Um, set aside that in part because in some cases they don't even have to, doesn't matter. And in other cases they, they do, but check. they don't tell you that, right? So um, because it's gonna be in some sort of subtle way where an admissions officer has met a student and the students interacted with them and they just have a feel for that student. And so they're gonna fight for that student a little bit harder when they get to the admissions decision, right? And those com those conversations about who they send acceptance letters to. But the degree to which that actually then plays out for a student, um, it it's it's really gone to, to now, most schools, it doesn't matter at all, not because the school doesn't want it to matter, but because the school just doesn't have a choice. The school needs to admit so many of the applicants because they just got to get enough students to keep the lights on that they can't even afford to think about demonstrated interest. And then for the schools that are getting thousands upon thousands of applications more than they ever need, demonstrated interest is never going to be the thing that is the difference between whether they get in or not, because so many other factors play in. And it's really, it, it would be really, really difficult to actually be able to parse and drill down. Uh, if, for folks who've read Jeff Salingo's book and his sort of experiences at Emory, um, it, it would be really, really hard to, to be able to go in there and say, oh yeah, none of the other factors mattered, but because that student demonstrated just the right amount of interest, that's how they got into Emory. I don't think so. Mark, would you say that is the same for waitlist? Waitlist is a is a different different kettle of fish, I think. Um, 
wait lists often i mean first of all there's a whole lot of schools that keep these wonderfully long wait lists that don't need any of those names on them anyway um and then for the schools that actually have the chance to go down that wait list um in my experience and just knowing people in the profession far too often it ends up being look we just need 10 more kids who can pay a bunch mm -hmm. so demonstrated interest isn't going to be the driving factor there at that point it's so much a minimal proportion of that overall class that it can often come down to we'll take 10 more full pays that's great um now if in a particular year in that range of type student traits and types that that school really wanted they were particularly short in one area yeah maybe they might think about that and look in their wait list but the situation with wait list is oftentimes the school starts going down that wait list and there's a whole bunch of students on there that they're not waiting anymore either they pick somewhere else so it it really does get to be this other element at the bottom of it, did demonstrated interest really make a difference? Uh, hard to say. So do you consider early action or early decision or restrictive early action as a way of demonstrated interest? Or is that separate? I don't really think of those things as a demonstrated interest piece um, so much as <laughs> for early decision, it's a a self-constraining step, right? The student says, all right, I really want to go to Dartmouth. So I'm applying early decision and that's it. Okay. Um, if you want to get really cynical, it's probably demonstrated interest on steroids, <laughs> but <laughs> it's, it's a different kind of entity there, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the number of students who get denied in early decision or early action, but then somehow get accepted in regular decision or early or, or regular decision. I don't, I don't know that there's a whole lot of data on that, but I don't know if, anecdotally that that's a, oh, because you applied early decision and we didn't accept you, we gave you extra bonus points when we got to regular decision. And then we were more likely to accept you in regular decision. Uh, I haven't seen evidence that, that enough evidence to suggest that that's a real thing. Yeah, I know we've had Jenny Kent and Jeff Levy. They were just on just a couple of weeks ago and yeah. they do the research, but it doesn't go down to that granular level. And, and right. as you said, there's really no way to find that data to substantiate it one way or another. Right. But but we do know demonstrated in, in terms of early action, early decision, particularly early decision is a way that colleges have built their um, yield rates, increased that, and, and basically help manage the planning of their classes much more precisely. But that's from a college perspective, not from a student or family perspective. And so that's a really small number of institutions, right? Of the, of the number of schools that are out there. <clears throat> it's a fair criticism that we all make, you know, the, the, in the media, we hear about colleges and this, colleges and universities, that. And way too often, the emphasis is on a very small subset of institutions and then the implication if not the general move is to apply those same things to the rest of higher ed. And it's just not that way. Mm -hmm. Higher ed looks a lot like uh, our society generally, where there's some, there's some haves a lot, and then there's a whole ton of have nots. And um, there's, a, there's an increasing gap between those two and fewer and fewer institutions in between. Yeah, yeah. And Allison sharing from um, Tulane is one of those that we know has used that uh, approach very successfully. Yep. Northeastern has as well. Yep. And, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's a great way to generate, I mean, from the college side, you're, and Peter will talk about this more, so I don't want to steal his, his fire because his fire is substantial. But from the college side, you get from the president and the business office, Right. We need this much money. We need this much money. That's how we keep the lights on. That's how we're going to increase faculty salaries. That's how we're going to do this new initiative. 
we need this much money. We got this many beds. All right. So you got that many beds to get this much money. And how you get that much money then becomes a, how do we get there? And if you find that your early decision, early action mechanism gets you to get a lot of folks that end up being willing to pay more than they would have otherwise, or you can get them to pay a little bit extra, well, then you're going to do that, right? Like you're running a business. That's just the way you would do it. And I don't think any of us honestly could say that we would do it otherwise if we were on the other side. Right. Um, and it's just how marketplaces work. It's a little frustrating from the other side because if you got a student that wants to go to Tulane and has no idea there's anything called early decision or early action, and then they find out that two thirds of the class is full before we even get to February, well, that's kind of frustrating, but that's the decision that that institution made. Right. Yeah, if they can't keep the lights on, there is not going to be a benefit for anybody, you know, one way right. or another. So, and I think that's one of the things too that that, especially here in the United States, you know, kind of have that gray area. It's like, well, colleges are altruistic institutions, but they are also businesses. So, so you have to look at it. And I know in my UCLA class, we talk about that, and people are often very surprised, like, yeah. oh yeah, they you know they have to come. So. What about, so in your article, you talk about how it may hurt a student by demonstrating interest in terms of that might affect the amount of scholarships and things that they get. So yeah. tell us a little bit more about that. How can it be detrimental to students? You referenced this sort of indirectly already in your note about somebody, somebody said, uh, somebody has shown how on Slate they're tracking every email and every open and clicks on the website and all this other stuff. Higher education institutions, top to bottom, are spending all kinds of money for different platforms and different consultants and different software and algorithms. And those algorithms drive so many of the decisions that they make. And those algorithms require data. And when you get more data, then you're able to think anyway and hope that you're going to be more successful in coming from this big wide funnel to that ultimate class of students that pay the numbers that you want them to pay. Um, using all that data, one of the things that institutions do is assess how likely that student is to actually enroll. And that's why we sort of talk about all the demonstrated interest stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But another part of that data is to assess, to predict how much is that student actually willing to pay? And one of the things that all that data suggests, again, you've got billions of data points that colleges are using to do this sophisticated strategic enrollment management. And one of the ways that they use that data is to say, you know what, that student seems to be suggesting that they think our institution is just really a higher value than some other students, the way they're interacting with us. And that suggests to me that they would be willing to pay a little bit more for the value that they perceive that we give them. So if a student has demonstrated all kinds of interest, I'm going to say, you know what? I'll bet that student's willing to pay a little bit more to come here. Th that was such a, there's enough evidence that that was actually going on, that I, that actually has been going on. There was enough evidence of that, that in 2016, the federal government, in the way that they send FAFSA data then to institutions, made a pretty distinct change in the way that they sent that data because the federal government was able to, to know enough to know that when that data was going to institutions, it was listed in such a way that an institution could see, did the student list us fifth on those 10 schools? Did they list us first? And if the student listed us first, I'm gonna think that we're their first choice. And if I think that we're their first choice, and in fact they are, then, 
I think I can charge them a little bit more and they're willing to pay it. Fast forward or take away that particular move that from the federal government and the, the way that FAFSA data gets sent to schools and just zoom that out more broadly to all the other data that the institutions collect. And that premise still exists. So when a student demonstrates a ton of interest and they're really about that, whether it has any influence on their admission decision or not, and let's just say that by and large these days, it won't, it will have some effect on the price that that institution charges them because the decision for the price and the decision to admit are made by different offices. And in many schools, they don't actually let those offices talk to each other, right? Um, Varsity Blues comes to mind, right? So they don't let them talk to each other anymore. So Allison asked the question, didn't they change it so colleges could no longer? Yes, that's what they changed in 2016. And they changed it specifically because they were able to identify that, yes, there are some institutions that are using that information in the way that it's sent out from the Department of Education to justify charging some students more than others. And the Department of Education rightly said, what, we don't really want to be a part of that. Um, so they stopped doing that. But the principle underneath that still remains in the data that institutions collect. And they, as you said, they really do collect everything you can think of and then some, because it all gets fed into their algorithms and their software that they're paying six and sometimes seven figures for every year to help them ensure that they get absolutely as much money as they can from the students that enroll. So what do, how do families combat this? You wanna show them enough love that they know that they're interested, but not so much that it detracts from how much money you get. So how do you find that happy medium? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I think I think a couple of things. One, I think you, you really do have to go back to, um, you have to go back to that, the days of your before, students and families were strategizing so much I mean, because some of the reason that students apply to more colleges now than they ever have is a function of strategizing right you don't know what your price is going to be so you're going to apply to more schools so that you hopefully have more choice when you get down the road and you find out what the bill is going to actually be right families and students have been strategizing for a long for a long time as a function of this opaqueness of information um i do think that there's a lot of value in just stepping back and saying be professional, be authentic, be genuine. And know that what you're gonna do going forward to engage a school or the schools you're interested in, you're just gonna put that forward as you as an engaged student because you're who that person really is. And use that as wherever you go to school, you know that you're going to make that experience great or terrible based on what you do, not what the school is. So adopt that trait as a human being first and then play that forward all the way into college. And I, and I think ultimately, you know, that's how, that's one way that you combat this. The other way, and it's a sort of shameless plug, I suppose, but if people use tools like tuition fit or other things and have the conversation about what's our price range anyway, mm -hmm. then you start to open up this, you know what, we're not creating young people that are pining to get into some place because that's defining who I am. And instead it's, I'm who I am. And any school that gets me is absolutely lucky to have me. And we put the power of their future back in the hands of the students, which is where it should have been all along. Right, right. Well, and that's one of the things we do as counselors and as advisors, yeah. you know, no matter where we are, whether working in a community-based organization, a school, public or private, or as an independent is, you know, trying to help 
um, promote that concept of the student and, and they and empower them in that process and get them them and their parents and whoever else is involved out of the whole, yeah, I have to go here, you know, because my whole future depends on this. And if I get rejected there, oh, my life is over. Right. And, and, you know, and there is so much emotion in that. And what you're advocating is trying to help take some of that emotion out. And I agree, we I've also done things with Gen Z, and we've talked about that, they are much more practical in many ways you know they've seen their their lives their parents have gone through a recession you know they've lost their homes things like that so they are looking more at pricing but there's still this emotional component to it and that is probably the hardest thing we have to work with families because sometimes they'll say it doesn't matter if you get into xyz dream school we will make it happen no matter what and so that's not a very practical approach yeah, it's tough. I mean, you, we are you, you're fighting an uphill thing, of course, right? Our society has become what it has become, and in a marketplace, the seller wants it to be an entirely emotional decision because mm-hmm. that's how you, they're going to get you to pay more than you probably would pay anyway, right? As a buyer, you want it to be more rational because then you know you'll be able to maintain your own price range and be more likely to succeed uh, later on and with other factors that relate to money in your own family. Um, one of the things that I know that I say to parents and, and you know, as much as they know this stuff, it's they're still susceptible to it too, right? Oh, but I, I do a lot of like, you know, step back and say, what's our goal in this whole process? Our goal is that our student as a young adult, has learned a lot, has grown up a lot, has graduated from college, and they have the financial freedom to pursue whoever it is that they have become. And given that 75% of graduates graduate in a major that's different than the one they had in mind when they showed up in college, you want them to have that flexibility to be able to pursue whoever it is they've become. And Mm -hmm. so when you think about and starting from that goal and walking it back, it sometimes helps families sort of get to a place where they can stay a little bit more focused and not get caught up in all the noise. But I, I know from talking to hundreds of counselors over the years um, that they have been known to have to repeat that message a few times to families because they'll hear it and then swept off their feet by some conversation they have with somebody else and they need to hear it again it's just a constant battle that we fight yeah it is and and it's an ongoing thing we've all had students go to colleges that they really couldn't afford you know NYU is a great um you mm-hmm. know example of that a lot of us have students and I've had students who who knew we knew going in there wasn't going to be enough financial aid or merit scholarships but yet being accepted you know they made it happen and you know but at least at least we all can feel like we've put all the cards on the table and allowed them to make a choice and we've brought transparency to the process and the outcomes are you know then then they do have choices as they make the outcome and it's a conscientious choice not an Um, out of your control choice. And so I think that's the important part of what you've been able to do with um, helping people to just be aware of actual financial aid awards and how that fits and and then use that as part of that transparency process. So um, now, is there a way to know if a college is using this process or not? How, how do we know, you know, like, you know, do you have this magic list of colleges that say to do this or not? What, what would your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, of course, it's, there's really no way to know uh, for sure. Um, and this is a thing that can change year to year. Um, mm-hmm we all know, and you can look at some of the data that folks collect, you know, Jeff and Jenny's data is a great source for this, where you can see how a different school number of freshmen over the last 10 years uh, can really change dramatically. 
And you know that the school's goal wasn't to have a dramatically different number of freshmen each year. And so if you see that they've really struggled in a year or two to have enough students, that next year they're going to try to get as many as they can. And so demonstrated interest may not be that big of a deal because they can't afford to be that way. Whereas you have a student, a school that's been very successful in a couple of years of getting a bunch of students, and they might think that they have that luxury. Um, the platform that I built at Tuition Fit and the folks that use it, it's really the, I think it's about as close as you can get to be able to see under the hood like that and see past all of the different curtains and, and all the fog to see how prices really do vary and what that means for you as a consumer and for you for students and families in terms of what they can say back to a school and say like yeah that that price is not going to work for me especially since i know that there's so much variation in the prices that you're charging and i can see those award letters right in front of me mm -hmm. um it's one thing to just tell a school i heard that you gave so and so this scholarship it's right. another thing to be able to say to the school I'm looking right at the award letters that you've given. If you want to go on tuition fit as a school and look, you can do it too. Like it, I'm seeing it. So um, I'm having a problem with this and I don't, I'm not comfortable with that. It changes the nature of the conversation and it changes the kind of leverage that the family has. And, you know, Peter will talk about this too, but when you think about strate strategic enrollment management from a college's perspective, you don't predetermine what every individual student's price is going to be. You say, all right, we got 100 students in this category of type that we want on average this amount of money from. Well, they're not going to get every single student in that group to pay that exact average, but you're hoping that you're going to get some that will pay a little more than that so mm -hmm. that you can get the ones that need to pay a little less than that. Mm -hmm. So what happens? The first offer that a school is going to send out and a lot of times it's not going to be at that dollar amount that they're shooting for at their average. That first amount is going to be a little higher than that so that you've got some wiggle room. And the ones that, how they decide which ones they ought to send that little bit higher amount, well, that's where demonstrated interest plays in. And again, if you don't know that as a consumer right. and you don't know what anybody else's prices are, you're sort well, of stuck. And Mark, I mean, this points to a whole equity issue too. Absolutely. Um, you know, I mean, I am in, and Mary, most people know, you know, where I am in here in Central California, probably 85% of the students I work with are first generation. Yep. You know, they have successful parents, but they're, they're successful in other areas and they're sending their kids to college. Well, they don't know that there's this process. They look at, at it and think it's all you know, what they see is what they get. They don't don't realize there's all this hidden agenda underneath. And right. and it can be very disconcerting and it, it can be very um, demoralizing for a lot of students and families. I just had this experience this week and sitting down, this parent had no idea how much, she's also not from this country. She attended school here, but she had no idea how much college was going to cost and all these different things. So yep. um, there is a, I mean, the fact that there's all these things that you have to do is, is such an equity issue, you know, in my mind. We do a lot of work with um, college access organizations and uh, all over the country. And so many times they're starting with students who are ninth and 10th graders because they have to start with them yep. to debunk the affordability myth because those yep. families have already decided that college is too expensive. Yep. Not even gonna look. And those families are cynical enough that when you tell them, oh no, 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 there's lots of scholarship money, they're like, Yeah, I've heard that shell game before. Thanks, but no. Right. Until you can show them actual prices from actual schools with the ward letters to students just like them, you can't debunk that myth. So they need this data to get past that very first barrier. Yeah. And then it plays out over and over in different ways throughout that student's journey where that organization's helping those students and trying to make sure that 
they're always on the edge of that student just ghosting them, right? Yeah, this process is just too hard. It's too stressful. I know I'm not one of those folks. I don't belong in that part of the culture. So I just, I'm going to just, for my own emotional safety, I'm out. And all of those organizations and, and many of the folks on this call can talk, tell us stories of students who applied to schools, didn't know what they didn't know, got prices that were way more than they thought, and they just stopped never followed up, never went to college, never pursued it, and just went back and told all their friends and family, yeah, that whole thing, it turns out it is a scam, and I'm kind of mad I even bought into it for as long as I did. And then we have a harder time convincing anybody else from that extended family or community mm -hmm. to pursue the college option because somebody with a real experience says, yeah, I tried that. Without this, this data, this is... we." are exacerbating the gap between the have and have nots. And yeah. we can't survive as a society if we keep doing that. No, we need to provide a way for families to be able, I mean, it's their their exit ramp for an opportunity yeah. to, to close those gaps and upward mobility. So we have a couple of more qu questions that I see in the chat and we do have a few more minutes, but Allison, um, somebody asked about, let's see, where is it? Who sees the results? Stephanie asks, who sees the results of the FAFSA? The admissions or the financial aid folks? And for a high need student, is demonstrated interest more or less valuable? So the FAFSA stuff's going to the financial aid office. It, at some institutions, they have a very strict policy that admissions and financial aid don't talk about the stuff in their own shops. At other institutions, they don't have that policy. So it's hard to know which school is which. Um, but that fast Enrollment management just it covers both. You know, if right. you're an enrollment management office, you have both admissions and financial aid. And even then, uh, I know of, you know, I, I know of a number of big publics, reasonably uh, prestigious flagships where they still have this long, even though they're applying all of these different elements to their process to be strategic and, and meet their enrollment goals, they still are adamant about this line between the two. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it, it, it depends on the institution, but that data is first going to sit in front of the financial aid office. And then it might bleed over into decisions about um, admission or or even further decisions about how they sort of come together to organize the aid package. Somebody asked this a related question they were asking about, does this apply to need and, or is it applied to, is it both need and merit? Right. This is another thing that, that um, people outside of the colleges sort of, and the colleges don't mind this at all, that we understand that we think that there's these two distinct pots of money that institutions award from merit and need. And those two things are very different. They don't talk to each other. Um, at most institutions, it's one pot of money that's sort of fake money anyway, because it's money that is from the sticker price to the actual price that they never, they haven't collected and they have never going to collect. It's sort of monopoly money. But it's just, we just got to put together a package enough to get that student to come. And so what that means then is on the award letter, you might have a very different set of line items that get you to the very same price as somebody down the street. Mm -hmm. And it's intended that way so that that student feels like, oh, I got special scholarships just for, for being me and my volunteering or my oboe playing or whatever it is. At the college's level, they already said, yeah, you're both in the same bucket and you both need to pay about the same price because that's what our model tells us we got to do. But in order to make you feel good, we're going to make sure that we give you line items that recognize something about your application so that you feel like an individual, like they really want. You. And um, this plays out in a whole bunch of ways that sometimes is entirely reasonable and sometimes really seems pretty nefarious. But you won't know that unless you're able to see all those award letters. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that the blurring of the lines between need and merit um, has definitely, we've seen that changing yep. and amping up over, and especially because 
there's so little need-based awards now available compared right. to the total cost of the college. You know, it ha that's the other thing that hasn't caught up or kept, you know, in line at all. So, right. so at yeah. most places, at, at most schools, the ones that are not in that sort of elite rarefied air, um, the only really clearly need-based money is essentially money that is a pass-through that's coming from the Pell Grant or coming from the state need, need policy grant that then comes into the institution and the student gets credit for obtaining that, but it's not actually money that comes from the college's coffers in the first place. Right, 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 yeah. And they're always gonna use, and Pierre will talk about this too, they're always gonna use their not their own money. Their own money is gonna be less. They're always gonna pull in as many other sources of money of first that they possibly can for, for understandable reasons. Yeah, again, you know, I, yeah. I want to make sure people understand this is not, you know, we understand and, and appreciate and the, the value and the mission of higher institutions in the United States. Um, but understanding these, this inside view is also helpful for us and for students and families. So um, Leanne asked about the 99 demonstrated interest colleges, those that complete the list where they rate DI very highly. Mm -hmm. do, we, do we consider that? Do we trust that? What, you know? Well, they don't just rate that. Remember in the common data set, there's a whole list of things that those schools rate. And there's nothing in the common data set that says, okay, we rate the test score as 55% of the equation to decide and the GPA as 40% and then the demonstrated interest at 5%. Like they, they don't, nobody reports anything like that. You just get this big long list of, do you use this criteria and the schools will check off reasonably which ones they suggest. Um, I, one thing about the common data set that I think is always really important for people to know in that particular part of the common data set, it is just fill it out as fast as you can and send it in. That doesn't mean that it's particularly accurate. Right. Now, some of the numbers, they have to be accurate because they have to line up with iPads, right? Enrollment numbers, total numbers uh, for aid, different things, even though the aid can be projected or real and you can fill it out either way and that produces different numbers. But when it comes to what criteria do you use, I have seen plenty of places where it's the same checked off stuff for 10 years. Nothing's changed, but it's absolutely changed at that institution. They're just checking stuff off as they did last year. So yeah. with those 99 institutions, I think you just really have to take it with a grain of salt. And let's just say for, for purposes of the argument, yes, they, they do consider it a lot. There's plenty of places that consider all of the factors a lot. So how much weight that gets, it's, I'm skeptical. <laughs> we never would have known. <laughs> I know, know, I know, sorry. <laughs> um, That's what happens when you work in higher ed for 25 years and come out the other side, you're like, yeah, I kind of know how this dance works. <laughs> Were you in public and private? What kind of higher yeah. ed institutions did you work in, Mark? I've been at small private. I've been at giant public. I've been at medium public. I've been at uh, specialized public. The first college I, I worked at was used to be called the University of Missouri Rolla, now mm -hmm. Missouri University of Science and Technology. Mm -hmm. By the way, just always love our engineers who name their school such that the acronym is MUST. And <laughs> oh, they never thought that that might have two meetings because God love our engineers. <laughs> but I've been at a lot of different institutions and I've, I've seen a lot of different situations where, you know, at the University of Iowa in admissions, you're in a really different position than you are at Central Michigan University for example, um, where they're 40% decrease enrollment over 10 years compared to where they were. I mean, it, it's stunning to think that they're even still around practically, but um, 
I've been in a lot of different places. That's true. Okay. Well, great. Well, we are totally out of time. Mark asked a really um, long involved question about, and I'm thinking we've kind of answered this question. Um, Mark, if you want to just put a chat or something in the Yeah, window. I'll peek at it here. Um, and Leanne just put in the link to sign up for uh, Mark's newsletter. Um, and as we're closing, Mark, ex explain what, like, how, if somebody wants to learn more about Tuition Fit, what, what, what should they do? First thing to do is just email me. I mean, obviously, you can go to the website and you can see all the stuff that websites do. And our website's just like everybody else's. There's lots of information. It's sort of cool. It does some nice stuff. And then you'll always have questions. Like, that's just a given, right? Um, but folks are welcome to email me at mark at tuitionfit.org. Um, many of you are already a part of this, but some of you aren't. And you're welcome to join it, the Tuition Fit Collaborative, where it's simply you make Tuition Fit part of your process. We give you a free access to search the data set. And you're part of this collaboration to create real price transparency. And it doesn't cost anybody anything. It's you know just a let's team up to fix this, because if we don't, nobody will. And that starts with just shoot me an email. OK, well, thank you, Mark. Thank you very much for being here today. And thank you. We've had over 50 people in the audience today, um, and which I know taking time out on a Friday afternoon in the two weeks, 11 days from November 1st was quite uh, monumental. So thank <laughs> you, everybody. And if you didn't get your question answered, again, send a direct email to Mark. Join me in two weeks. So the next Friday Forum will be November 4th. And that's when Peter Van Buskirk, he's going to join us and talk about financial aid, who gets it and why. There's some very, very fundamental things and some things that'll build on what Mark and I've talked about today. And then we're also November 18th, um, Eric Roth is going to come and he's presented at NACAC and talking about data. So we're, we're kind of combining these two topics of college affordability and having data. And the more we have data, the more informed decisions we can make, more informed um, information we can share with our families. So Eric's going to share that. And, and then we'll be into December, which is hard to believe. Um, <laughs> so I'm um, working on our our December lineup. Um, I might do just, I have a financial aid presentation I've done for years from parents and families. I think I'm going to update that and I'm, I might make that available in December. So everyone, thank you for being here again, Mark. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you. Um, keep track of everybody. You know, Have a great weekend and take care of yourselves and I'll see you in two weeks. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.